easier to manage and make it easier for multiple users to collaborate on a single large assembly. They can also be used to create an indented bill of materials for an assembly design. For these, and many other reasons, it's important for you to be comfortable creating subassemblies in a variety of ways. The easiest method for creating a subassembly is to simply place an existing assembly into another assembly. This process causes the inserted assembly to behave as a subassembly. I need to add the staple holder subassembly to this stapler model. So I'll click on Place, select the stapler holder subassembly component, and click Open. The assembly is attached to the cursor, so all I have to do is click to place it, just like with the part. I could continue placing the assembly if I wanted more copies, but I just need one. So I'll right-click and select OK. You can see in the browser that the staple holder subassembly has an assembly icon, and when I expand it, there are only two components that make it up. Even in a simple case like this one, there are advantages to using subassemblies. For instance, I only need to add constraints between the two assemblies, since the subassembly's parts are already constrained together. To show you what I mean, I'll launch the constrain command. The default mate constraint works here. So I'll zoom in on the parts. Select the axis of the hole in the staple holder, the axis of the hinge pin, and click Apply. Next, I'll create another mate constraint. This time between the YZ planes of the main assembly and the staple holder subassembly. Right now, the staple holder isn't positioned how I want it, so I'll change the solution to flush and then click OK. You can see that because the subassembly came with existing constraints, I only have to add two additional mates in order to correctly position the subassembly within the main assembly. Another advantage of having the parts assembled ahead of time is that they can easily be used in other assemblies. Without the use of subassemblies, I would have to add the parts here individually and then create the constraints necessary to position them in every following assembly where they're used. Although this example only has a few components, it it's easy to imagine how time-consuming this can be for assemblies that have hundreds of components. In addition to creating assemblies ahead of time, I can also take individual components that already exist in the assembly and make them into a subassembly. For example, in this assembly, the stapler base, staple plate, and plate holder were assembled ahead of time. To create a stapler base assembly from these components, I'll select all of them in the browser, right-click, and select Component. Demote. A new assembly is created when components are demoted, so the Create in Place component dialog box displays. I'll name this new component Stapler Base. You can use any template you want to use using the template option, but I'll use the default standard one. You also have the option to change the file location for the new assembly. I'll leave the default here. And finally, you can set the default bomb structure. The stapler base is a line item in the bomb, so I'll use normal here. And click OK. A warning dialog displays because some assembly constraints might fail when Inventor demotes components. Typically, you'll create the subassembly anyway, but you should check the constraints to make sure none of them are lost. At this point, the file only exists in memory. If I close the stapler assembly without saving, the new subassembly file will not be created. So I'll go ahead and save. Say yes to all to include the subassembly and click OK. The stapler base assembly is now listed in the browser. And you can see the staple base, staple plate, and plate holder components are inside it. When I demoted these parts, I included the stapler base component that grounded the main assembly, so now there's no grounded component on the top level.
meaning the main assembly is free to move around when I drag it. This is an important issue, since it's best practice to always have at least one grounded component in a main assembly. Why is grounding an assembly so important, though? Well, when Inventor solves the assembly constraints, it goes through the possible values for each constraint until it finds a set that doesn't cause a conflict. If there isn't a grounded component, or one that is fully constrained to the assembly origin, the whole assembly can move during an update, which can interfere with its center of mass. Here, I want to ground the stapler base at the assembly origin. So I'll go to the Productivity panel, select Ground and Root Component, then select the Stapler Base subassembly, and click OK. When I do, the command creates flush constraints between the component's origin planes and the assembly origin planes, and then grounds it, denoted by the pin icon in the browser. Once it's grounded, the base is unable to move. You can also drag components out of a subassembly and promote them to the main assembly. As I do this with the staple guide component, notice that a separator bar displays when I position the component where it can be dropped. I'll place it and click Yes when the warning dialog displays. This can be helpful when deciding component hierarchy. But for this assembly, I want to keep the part nested in its original subassembly. So I'll drag it back. 